This is Musings of the Shy podcast. I'm your host, Rosia Shy. Episode 122, The Other Guys, People Who Have Worked on Bitcoin Code. So this is Rosia with a uh, another uh, app in the series about the block size debate, uh, what's going on within the Bitcoin community. Uh, we're building up to the actual de- uh, debate itself, like the technical aspects of it, um, and the different parties involved in trying to create a solution for uh, whether to expand the block size, what size it should be expanded, what type of solutions to help uh, Bitcoin grow as a network. Um, so last episode was the philosophy episode, like the different types of parties and thought processes that not only help uh, lay the foundation work for the Bitcoin community, but the different types of groups that were gravitated to the concept of Satoshi Nakamoto's white paper, but also the implementation of the, the first round of Bitcoin code, if you will. Now we're going to discuss the other guys, the other people that um, have contributed to the actual code of the Bitcoin. Um, some of them will intersect with people that have created businesses within the Bitcoin space. But I think I, because some of these names, particularly in the uh, debate of the block size, have been bantered around for the, like, I would say, like the last three years really or last two to eh, 2014 is really when this kind of heated up i mean i know lightning network and segwit were like proposed in 2015 but really this is something that was discussed for quite some time now and so just kind of give an idea of who these people are i mean but depending on when you um, became part of the community maybe you are um, completely fully aware of them maybe you kind of sort of know them Maybe you saw some tweets or uh, medium post or just post within their, either, um, depending on what outlet you look at, uh, either on Reddit, uh, the Bitcoin talk forum, um, just around the space. Maybe you're a coder and you go on GitHub and you look at the different um, proposals, uh, the the BIPs, if you will, and we'll get into what BIPs are after this. Uh, just can, kind of get a sense who these people are and what their placement is and why some people emphasize uh, that particular coder over this particular coder and what it, I guess you just can say like what it is that they have done for the um, Bitcoin community and the other guys I'm just right here I'm going to focus on the other individuals that have participated in the actual coding of Bitcoin but they're not the only people that have helped contribute in the expansion and that's when we're going to talk about the businesses um, after the BIP episode we'll talk about the businesses that have contributed to the network and the leaders of those different types of companies. But before we get into all that, before we talk about the other guys, uh, so MasterCard launches credit card with a built-in fingerprint scanner. And this is going to go over so well. Uh, MasterCard has unveiled a brand new payment card that is built in biometric fingerprint scanner, allowing customers to authorize payments with their fingerprint without requiring a PIN code or a signature. The company is already testing the new biometric payment cards combined with an onboard chips in South Africa and says it hopes to roll out the cards to the rest of the world by the end of 2017. This is from Hacker News with the author being um, Mohit Kumar. Don't worry, it still supports PIN-based transactions as fallback. Wait, if you think this feature would not allow you to share your card with your child and spouse, don't worry. MasterCard has a solution for that issue as well. The company has confirmed that even if the card is configured, configured to accept fingerprint for uh, author, authenticating a purchase, but it's, it's still the, but it's, does it still have a pin as a fallback in case for some reason uh, EMV readers fail to read the fingerprint or you have your yourself handed it to your child for shopping. Stores and real, realtors don't need to, uh, new hardware. According to MasterCard, the new biometric card will not require store owners and businesses to buy any new hardware like fingerprint scanners, because the sensors in the card reads your fingerprint. I think that's very key, because particularly here in um, the States, the, I believe is the Dodd-Frank bill, had made an acquire, or requirement for not only for the implementation of the, the chips into um, the credit card readers, but if you are a, a business um, and you don't have a, if you didn't upgrade your equipment, than to allow for the reading of the chips. If there's any purchases that are made, you're going to be held liable. You used to have that protection for fraud protection if um, prior to the Dodd-Frank bill passing, 
But now if you don't have the hardware, if you didn't upgrade to the new system, if you will, then you're going to be held liable for any of those transactions that occur um, within your store if there's a fraud or a false transaction. So the fact that just after everyone just upgraded to these chip um, reader uh, systems, and not even some big retailers are not doing the, the chip card thing, uh, there's a series of issues with it. Um, and I think there might have been a delay in enforcement, but I'm not positive on it. I just know that a lot of business is still up to this date. And that came into effect October of 2016. Um, still haven't upgraded their um, systems. And so after shelling out whatever amount of money for however many um, outlets, payment outlets for every cash register or whatever, or if you're a convenience store and you have gas, to be to be um, forced to for just one credit card company to <laughs> buy new hardware is, I think, is very important. That's not the case. Since both the data and the scanners exist on the same card, the new payment cards work with existing EMV card terminals infrastructure. The standard chip swipe readers can find at many stores these days, though the old magnetic strip only terminals won't be compatible. But banks need to adopt new technology. Before the new cards can be adopted worldwide, your banks or financial institutions will have to get on board with the new tech. If you want the new biometric card, you're currently required to go to your bank branch in order to have your finger scanned and register for the new tech. Your fingerprints will then be converted into an encrypted digital template that is stored on the, guards, the card's EMV chip. You can save up to two fingerprints, but both would have to be yours. You cannot authorize someone else, even for your, from your family, to use your card with, your, with their fingers. So I guess with joint accounts, this is not going to work out. Once your templates are saved, your card is ready to use at the compatible terminals across the world. Merchants don't have to purchase new equipment to accept your fingerprint enable payment card. Now, while shopping at any store, just place your biometric card into the realtor's EMV terminal and then put your finger on the embedded sensor to pay. Your fingerprints will be verified against the template stored on your card. Can fingerprints be forged and other concerns? The new card is made in an attempt to make face-to-face -face payments more convenient and more secure, but this type of biometric verification is useless when it comes to online shopping and so does not provide any security over credit card frauds. Whether unlocking a smartphone or shopping online, the fingerprint is helping to deliver additional convenience and security. It's not something that can be taken or replicated and will help our cardholders get on with their lives knowing that their payments are protected, uh, MasterCard Security Chief Ajit Baha said. But this isn't true. Fingerprints can be faked, unfortunately, and we have seen previous research in which high-resolution images were used to make fake fingerprints for malicious purposes. So criminals can put a fake fingerprint on top of their finger to shop for stolen cards. In addition to biometric cards, MasterCard is also planning to bring con content, content, <clears throat> content, contactless payments, which should function similar to mobile payments like Apple Pay, where users authenticate themselves via fingerprint while holding their smartphone against the terminal. So, I don't know why they just don't go for Bitcoin. You know, that makes it so much easier. Uh, Spells of Genesis. Spells of Genesis game launches app. Uh, Spell of Genesis game launches app for iPhone and Android. Uh, Spell of Genesis is a blockchain-based mobile game which was released on the Apple App Store and Google Play Store yesterday. This article came out April 21st. So Spe Spell of Genesis is available in App Stores. The blockchain-based fantasy trading card game Spell of Genesis has been added to the to these stores. That means the cryptocurrency is one step closer to mainstream adoption as anyone with an iOS or Android device can now play the game. Uh, Shabin Shaim, CEO and the founder of the Everdream Soft, Soft, stated it's a huge milestone because SOG will be one of the first IOC projects to hit the mainstream market. The news comes 18 months after the initial coin offering or ICO campaign in which the Swiss space Everdream Software, the company behind the SOG, collected 934 BTC in exchange for Bit Crystals or BCYs, a crypto asset issued on the blockchain on the Bitcoin blockchain. The BCY is used to purchase in-game content and to lock certain features. Not only is SOG offering gamers the ability to actually own their in-game balance and exchange it for BTC, other cryptocurrency, and fiat, they're also leveraging blockchain technology to bring life to the concept of rare trading cards. So you may have seen these, you know, shared about these trading cards. Um, we talk about, like, stuff within the blockchain space or Bitcoin or emphasize, like, either people or concepts. Um, they're very well done extremely beautiful artwork i wonder if they will ever issue like an actual um trading trading physical cards but right now everything is kind of digital and mobile 
Uh, the Spell of Jesus is a mobile game that brings the elements of trading games along with uh, an arcade-style gaming aspect. Uh, SOG is influenced by blockchain technology on various levels. Not only are bit crystals used to monetize the game, rare trading cards are also cryptographic assets on the Bitcoin blockchain. But that's not all. The blockchain technology is one of the main focus of the storyline with rare cards featuring known coins, services on people like Satoshi Nakamoto card, the Ethereum card, and even a fork card that symbolizes the current Bitcoin scaling debate. And so SOG allows gamers to learn about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency in a playful environment where users can discover the history so far and the features, tools provided by different projects through the cards themselves and preparing um, entered users for the overwhelming world of blockchain technology should they choose to delve into it. Uh, despite being one of the first ICO projects to reach mainstream audience, BitCrystals is not only a cryptocurrency and gaming project out there. In fact, two seem to have formed a perfect match. Starting with the Gamma Lane, Bitcoin changed the way we interact with online casinos, making Gamma Lane transparent and much more efficient. Today, there are multiple provable fair Gamma Lane websites. Online gaming itself has also been limited in the sense that all of the accomplished gamers were nothing more than data is served, which they could never export in the real world. Thanks to the blockchain technology, users can be rewarded for their efforts by selling or trading in-game items and cards for actual money. So that used to be something within the gaming space, especially like World of Warcraft and um, SGO. People used to be able to trade that stuff, but um, a lot of that got um, shut down, if you will. You can't do it anymore. There was a big scandal. I forgot what it was. I'm not sure it was Second Life or one of the, the uh, MORG games out there. Their economy like collapsed or something, the in game economy, and things went to sideways, if you will. And I guess new laws were implemented where you couldn't do that legally anymore. You have to use um, the gamers or the game, gamer creators' uh, stores. They will block accounts or kick people out if they find out that you sold your account or sold items and stuff like that or traded them. So, this is a good way for people to be able to, you know, make money for the time and effort they put in into something they like. Although SOG is the first of its kind, others that follow, where Pepe, a meme based game, uses a similar system to Spell of Genesis in order to create and record rare Pepe cards on the blockchain. These can be exchanged for BTC and other cryptos. Although rare Pepe is not a game in itself, it's becoming extremely popular in the crypto space, with cards being bought and sold for exorbitant prices. Cryptocurrency assets have also become a way to gamify the existing platforms by creating decentralized incentive models and ways for players to compete among themselves. The first Blood Project, for example, is a decentralized platform that uses smart contract technology to make esports tournaments and matches between games gamer, uh, gamers fair and transparent, along allowing gamers to profit from their skills. Uh, mobile Go also comes to mind, a dual blockchain token that will be used to gamify the Game Credits mobile app store. Despite the growing uh, chain washing trend where projects use blockchain technology for the hype and not for the technology itself, the game seems to be the one step ahead by bringing being of the few industries where blockchain technology is already having a visible impact on changing the way we play. So there's some good news there. So that's it for the news. On to the other guys. Um, storage to migrate um, cloud storage services to Ethereum blockchain from the from counterparty over Bitcoin. So this came out at the end of uh, last month. Or I should say the end of March. Uh, Storage Labs, uh, which is written by Rebecca Campbell, announced that it's planning on moving its blockchain-based cloud storage network from its current counterparty protocol over to the Ethereum blockchain. The Atlanta-based company announced it in a blog post that one of the reasons for the planned move is due to the current issues with the Bitcoin's blockchain transaction backlog and long transaction times. The counterparty smart token platform runs on top of the Bitcoin blockchain. Additionally, the fees that storage have to pay are no longer sustainable. In the blog post, Sean Wilkinson, CEO and CTO of Storage Labs, said, um, Counterparty transactions create small inputs and are heavier than normal BTC transactions, so users have experienced extremely high fees for transactions. For the February farmer output, we paid over $1,600 in transaction fees, or about 10% of the total payout. This is not sustainable or scalable. A stagnant development. Wilson, Wilkinson cites the lack of counterparty growth as a concern with no major updates in more than two years, while his interface was confusing for new users. However, he believes that Ethereum platform will provide the answers. Wilkinson commended, commented that Ethereum ERC20 token suggested that storage SJCK token could be migrated over to the Ethereum standard token. While the progress of its feature layer to solutions such as Raiden are promising is the poor ERC220 tokens, he added, 
So the ERC-20 tokens have been issued by a number of prominent project, projects including Arger, Arger and Golem and have wide support in the Ethereum development community. As storage tokens reach new high, after the news that storage labs will be moving to the platform to the Ethereum blockchain, the SGTC BTC exchange rate increased in a four-month high. According to the report from Razor Forex, storage tokens were priced around um, 0.000206 bitcoins. However, the price has since dropped to about 00019013 according to the coin market cap. However, it indicates a sign that those in support of the storage labs are in favor of such a move to Ethereum blockchain, which in turn will further help the community grow than it's doing, in, doing at present. For some initial steps have been taken to migrate storage labs away from the counterparty pro protocol, but to date as to when that will happen is yet to be released for Mobilson. In February, Storage Lab announced that it raised $3 million of seed founding with earlier backers, including those of Google Ventures, Iconic Security, uh, Cockroach Labs, and Qualcomm Ventures, and Techstar. So as you can see, um, due to you know the issues with the, the blockchain debate, you're seeing uh, companies react to that and changing their infrastructure to you know protect and keep themselves going. So the other guys, um, my information comes from <clears throat> several different sources, um, GitHub, Wicca, and a site called We Use Coins that breaks down uh, the different peoples that are involved within the Bitcoin space, both business, coders, and advocates of the space. How, we're, with this episode, we're um, emphasizing the other guys. So how these people came to be or part of the space is there's a there's a couple of spaces that have been meeting places for individuals to meet uh one is the the bitcoin dev mailing list this is where if you want to interact with the individuals working on the bitcoin uh code which are which is called bitcoin core then this is where you would go and make either proposals or discussions or solutions. Um, there's also an archive called Bitcoin Development. Um, another place is a, a website called BitcoinCo.in. Uh, there's our Bitcoin and RBTC, which is on Reddit. There's Bitcoin Talk, uh, BitcoinTalk.org, uh, Bitcoin.com is another site. These are the places that uh, the code, the code, the core developers, people that worked on the code. Individuals in the business have basically, or within the Bitcoin space, have basically interact and engage with one another to discuss how to improve Bitcoin, particularly how to improve the core. And the system that they use is called BIP, which we will do next episode. We'll discuss um, how BIP came into place, but it's BIP means um, Bitcoin Improvement Proposal, which you can see. Uh, on GitHub, and you can see the different proposals that have been um, talked about and bantered about uh, about the Bitcoin Core, which ones have been implemented, and which ones have been discussed and, and, and thought about. And in order to get something implemented, of course, you have to get the network to agree up upon it, but these proposals, uh, BIPs, if you will, are code improvements that uh, different coders have try to add to the Bitcoin code, to the Bitcoin core. And that is, the Bitcoin core is the basic baseline original code that uh, Bitcoin operates off of. Um, the wallets uh, with the miners based off of, uh, when you implement a node, uh, any of those things. Now, people have done offshoots and different things where they have taken elements of proposals from um, the BIP and created their different types of wallets that are able to interact with the Bitcoin core. Uh, there's just different types of nodes and even miners, the way they engage with the network is, can be done differently. And some of that has to do with proposed solutions that some have to do when we talk about miners, what is already being implemented. And also when we talk, oh, I think we're going to do a separate episode about nodes as well. But just kind of give an idea and sense of when we're talking about these guys, these two guys in particular, we're talking about the people that have actually either proposed a BIP or had their BIP implemented into the core. So this article is from Ben Zyga, and I just want to read it just so you can have a sense of the names and type of people behind Bitcoin. Uh, this comes all the way from way back in the day of 2013. 
by Alex Bliss. Uh, these are the people behind Bitcoin's rise. It's likely that you've heard about Bitcoin as legendary rise by now. A, a pseudonymous Japanese hacker laid out the blueprint for a peer-to-peer -peer digital currency uh, shortly before it vanishing into thin air. Um, and then it kind of comments on Bitcoin. So you have Soshitoki Nakamoto himself first. Uh, he or she or a group are are the he's I'm gonna go with he for now, but I actually, no, I'm not gonna go with he. Uh, this individual is responsible for creating the white paper and initiating the first um, code launch, if you will, of Bitcoin. Gavin and Anderson, um he's a Princeton graduate and the chief scientist at the Bitcoin Foundation and one of Nakamoto's earliest collaborators. Before vanishing, Nakamoto handed the Bitcoin reins to Andreessen, providing him access to the Bitcoin Source Forge project and a copy of the work of he. Mark Kolopoulos, uh, from Mt. Gox fame, he's, he's at the time was the owner of the largest Bitcoin exchange. As of April 2013, the Tokyo-based Mt. Gox handles 63% of all Bitcoin transactions. As the most powerful established for the anti establishment Establitarian currency, Kabapo sees his role as providing trust and much, much needed, which turns out to have been very much misplaced. Uh, Gonza Gay Bocci is Markov's right hand man. Uh, Marty Malum, uh, serious as Malum is commonly known in the Bitcoin circles, operates and hosts of Bitcoin.org. That's another meeting place where people engage and talk about Bitcoin. Uh, Sirius has taken an administrative role in building and maintaining crucial Bitcoin infrastructure. He's administrator of the Chief Bitcoin Forum, Bitcoin Talk, where he has a second. He was a second register. Hal Feeney, who passed away, is a legend in programming circles. He's one of the creators of PGP and one of the first uh, implementations of public key cryptography and one of the earliest contributors to the Bitcoin project. Uh, years before Bitcoin. Uh, Feedy created the first usable proof of work system in 2004. Patrick uh, Straitman, uh, he's a Bitcoin developer, best known for co founding uh, Instrasongo and the Python Bitcoin implementation. Instrasongo is a British bit based Bitcoin exchange offering multiple trading markets for trading Bitcoin. Um, Army Taki, uh, we've spoken to him about him in the past. He's uh, when we, uh, or I should say, uh, when I talked about Open Bazaar on the Hiroja Stop Bubble. Uh, he's a very interesting character, and I think I will do a review of him um, on Hiroja Thought Bubble. But he is responsible for the creation of BIP, as well as uh, contributions to the Bitcoin code in general. But most importantly, uh, he was one of the first people outside of uh, people that Satoshi Nakamoto contacted himself. He, you know, he emailed Satoshi Nakamoto and said, hey, I want to help. And that started the whole BIP system. Uh, the other thing he's known for is helping creation of the dark wallet, uh, something that he stated that he's getting back into, and um, trying to get the dark market, which was a fork that eventually became Open Bazaar. Uh, Jack of all trades, Taki, a London native, has dedicated his work to pioneering open source projects. He's responsible for creation of the Bitcoin and Instrasongo exchange, the Lip uh, Lipton Library for Bitcoin, uh, Spasmola, and establishing the Bitcoin uh, Constellency, uh, Vine Paco, uh, GLBS client, and Bitcoin po poker, poker client. Art Force, uh, Bitcoin to user, to talk user Art Force developed the first GUI Bitcoin miner using a private mining code that once held a high percentage of the network computing power, mining about 25% of all Bitcoin. Uh, today he controls less than 1% of the, of the computation power. Uh, Art Force other contributions to Bitcoin, including reporting Siri. Uh, Gary Rowe is a JavaScript uh, co contractor who's made significant contributions to the Bitcoin ecosystem. These include open source projects like Multibit, Exchange, and Bitcoin J. Uh, Multibit is a secure light, wa wa light wallet, international Bitcoin wallet for Windows, Mac OS, and Linux offered in various languages. Andreas uh, Schelbach, uh, the Berlin based developer, is the creator of the Bitcoin wallet for Android. Mike Hearn, is a core Bitcoin contributor. Mike Kern is a Google engineer who works who works on Gmail. He developed the Bitcoin J along with Gary Rowe. Nyla Scheiden. Scheiden has provided the Bitcoin uh, ecosystem with a boon of con contributions. He's the owner of Bitcoin Watch, a creator of Bitcoin charts, and has made significant contributions to the GPU 
GPU mining software and JS web, web interface. Jeff Garzik is a Toshi client core developer who's also founded Bitcoin Watch. When he's not developing Bitcoin, Garza works as a Linux kernel developer at Red Hat. Michael Markardit. Markardit Mar has eased communication in the Bitcoin community, founded the Bitcoin Talk forum, and created Bitcoin, uh, he created Block Explorer, a web tool that provides detailed information about Bitcoin blocks, addresses, and transactions. Luke Jr. Luke Jr. created uh, Agonis, a prominent Bitcoin mining pool. He also maintains V. BFG Miner, a modular ASIC FPGP GPU and CPU miner written in C, cross platform for Linux, Mac, and Windows, including for open write capable routers. He also maintains tools for merchants such as a Bitcoin ID and the Bitcoin KT, which is now uh, known as Bitcoin Core. That is the the initial wallet if you don't want to deal with uh, any other type of wallet system, whether it be um, mobile wallets, exchange wallets, or anything like that. Um, that's the the wallet that comes directly from the Bitcoin core developers themselves. Uh, Stefan Thomas is the creator of We Use Coins, the prominent portal into the world of Bitcoin for outsiders. Thomas has since gone on to create uh, Ripple and other digital currencies. Some speculate will be a Bitcoin comp competitor. It hasn't quite come to fruition, but it's still out there. Uh, Jeb McCaleb is best known as the original developer of the Mt. Gox Exchange, which he wound up selling to Coropolis. Um, <coughs> he might end up getting entangled into the whole legal ease of the Mt. Gox thing. Uh, he previously created e uh, Donkey 2000, a peer-to-peer -peer file sharing application. Like Thomas, McCaleb has gone from Bitcoin to become to being working on Ripple, a, a perceived competitor. He has other projects as well. Peter Wheel is a Toshi client developer. Wheel also maintains the network graphics a website for uh, Bitcoin software. Vladimir Marenko runs his own company, Marenko Limited, which sells mining contracts to Bitcoin users. Matt Corolla is a computer scientist student at the University of North Carolina Chapel. Um, Corolla is a Satoshi client developer. And lastly, Patrick McFarlane. McFarlane is the creator of Dilabo Miner, a Java GPU mining Bitcoin miner that uses the OpenCLL framework to quickly perform the hashing of, excuse me, a computation in addition. McFarlane is a Bitcoin forum moderator. This is kind of giving you a sense of these people. Uh, some of them we're going to talk about directly because um, as this little article stated, uh, they've helped contribute to the Bitcoin um, protocol, the codes themselves. Many of them um, have gone on to create companies or other cryptocurrencies. So there's a, there's a lot of intersection intersectionality when it comes to contributing to the Bitcoin core, as well as either founding or participating in um, Bitcoin-based companies. So let's start with Nick Sabu. Nick Sabu is one of the people that Satoshi Nakamoto had contacted to help with the Bitcoin protocol. He's also um, has his own blog called Unenumerated, where he has spoken about uh, various issues when it comes to the Bitcoin community, as well as just computing technology in general. He comes from the cypherpunk movement, which is responsible for laying down the foundation for Bitcoin's existence. He's also made significant contributions to um, Bitcoin, uh, not Bitcoin, but com the community itself with his concepts, but just uh, um, software or technology in general towards, you know, the improvement of people's quality of life. He in particular is known for his concept of smart contracts. When you have the reason why you have things like the DAO and Ethereum, it's based off his particular um, idea. So here we go. This is from Wicca. Uh, Nick Sabo is a computer scientist, legal scholar, and cartographer known for his research in digital contracts and digital currencies. He graduated from the University of Washington in 1989 with a degree in computer science. The phrase and the concept of smart contracts was developed by Sabo with a goal to bring what he calls a highly evolved practice of contract law and practice design of uh, electronic commerce protocols between strangers on the internet. Smart contracts are a major feature of cryptocurrency in the program language. Uh, Sabo's influence um, argued that a minimum granulating uh, grand of micropayments is set by a, a mental transaction cost. He also developed uh, one of the early predecessors of Bitcoin called BitGold. So in 1998, Sabo designed a mechanism for digital, current, digital currency he called BitGold. Bitcoin was never implemented, but has been called a direct per, per, 
precursor to the Bitcoin architect. In Zabo's Bitcoin scheme, a participant would rededicate computer power to solving a cryptographic puzzle. In a Bitcoin gold network, solved puzzles will be sent to the Byzantine fault-tolerant public registry and assigned to the public key of the solver. Each solution will become part of the next challenge, creating a growing chain of new property. This aspect of the system provided a way for the network to verify and timestamp new coins because unless a majority of the parties agreed to accept new solutions, they couldn't start on the next puzzle. When attempting to design transactions with a digital coin, you run into a double spending problem. Once data has been created, reproducing them is a simple matter of copying and pasting. Most digital currencies solve this problem by relinquishing some control to a central authority, which keeps track of each account balance. This was an unacceptable solution for Sabo, I was trying to mimic as closely as possible in cyberspace the security and trust characters of gold, and chief among them, those, is that it doesn't depend on a trusted central authority, he said. In 2008, a mysterious figure who wrote under the name Satoshi Nakamoto released a proposal for Bitcoin. Nakamoto's true identity remained a secret, which led to speculation among the long list of people suspected to be Nakamoto uh, was Nick Zabo. Although Zabo has repeatedly denied it, people have speculated that he is Nakamoto. A research by financial author Dominic Thiesby provided circumstantial evidence, but he admits no proof that Satoshi is Zabo. Speaking on RT's uh, uh, Kaiser report, he said, I could co- I've concluded that there's only one person in the whole world that has the sheer breadth, but also the specificity of knowledge in it. It's this chap. On July 2014, email to Fresby, Zabo said, thanks for letting me know. I'm afraid you got it wrong. Doxing me as Satoshi, but I'm used to it. Uh, Nathaniel Popper wrote in the New York Times that the most convincing evidence points to a reclusive American man of Hungarian descent named Nick Zabo. In 2008, prior to the release of Bitcoin, Zabo wrote a comment on his blog about the intent of creating a live version of his hypothetical currency. In 2015, the subvention blockchain Ethereum named as a subunit of Ethereum value token to the Zabo. In 2017, Zabo noted that the Bitcoin core proposal of Sager Segregated witness is security risk because it increases bandwidth usage, although he has been even more ardent opponent of alternatives such as Bitcoin Unlimited. And there's a core question um, you can read if you want, whether or not Nick Zabo is Satoshi Nakamoto. A lot of people uh, point to the similarities between his um, paper concerning smart contracts and his other writings to that of the, the Bitcoin white paper how uh, it is, has a similar syntax and language, but others have noted that because Nick Sabo um, is such a prominent person within this uh, cryptography space, within this uh, niche space of technology, um, that basically all that uh, anyone could have done was just basically take his concepts and his writing styles and just kind of reword it. Um, I want to say direct plagiarism, really, but just taking his... Um, his concepts really and just rewording it and, and put it in the paper and it necessarily means that it's Nick Sabo really. There's that counterpoint if you will. And he has a blog a blog called Merated which he talks about um, various things about um, t- cryptography technology about the Bitcoin blockchain space um, his thoughts about you know segregated witness and Bitcoin Unlimited um, and, and about there's different types of subjects he's very well He's a very strong writer, um, very knowledgeable, and it's a great read if you want to have an understanding overall about the economics, about technology, about coding, and about this space. His writing, I want to say, is very simple, but it's is at such a level that you can um, follow along. Um, you probably might have to look up a few concepts or a few phrases that he utilizes, but uh I think it's simple enough that anybody could participate and discuss what he has to say. Now, he has never contributed directly to the code, um, but some people believe he may have done so through maybe just commenting through emails between him and Satoshi Nakamoto, which was released. But he, he himself never actually directly or has acknowledged directly writing particularly the code. He's very... Um, and offish when it comes to that. So when you go to the bit proposals, you won't see Nick Sabo's name up there, but he 
he definitely has a significant influence on the code, on the, the concept of Bitcoin, and through the various um, initial blog posts and forums where uh, developers and people that were participating in the development of the code, Nick Sabo has made some comments and contributions that people were able to build off of. Now, the next person has, in fact, uh, contributed directly to the code. He is a current core Bitcoin core developer, and his name is Luke Jr. Um, We wrote about him as, or not wrote about him, but we we talked about him in that uh, article as one of the uh, prominent people within the space. You can find him, (coughs) I have a link in the show notes to his GitHub. Uh, You can find his information on WeCoins. So Luke. Just kind of, I guess I should say this now, but we'll go in deep detail um, later when we talk about um, the actual block size debate, the different parties, if you will. Uh, the Bitcoin core, which is the actual people that have um, a say in the development of Bitcoin in itself, the core, they control the code. Uh, those individuals are uh, Andrew Polster, Coley Few. Corey Fields, Eric Labazo, Gregory Maxwell, Jonas Chenille, Luke, Luke Dash Jr. or Luke Jr., Mark uh, Friedbach, Peter Todd, Peter Will, and Waldemar Van Dierlon uh, are part of Bitcoin Core. Um, there's a company that some of these guys would participate or are a part of, which is Blockstream, and that's Andrew Polster, Dr. Adam Back, Gregory Maxwell, Mark Biederman Back, and Peter Will. And I think we're just going to stay there. So we're just going to deal with the, just the code development. There's, you know, Bitcoin Unlimited. There's those who help create the uh, Lightning Network and Segregated Witness. And when we when we break those technical aspects down, we'll talk about them as well. But right now, Luke Dash, Luke, uh, Luke Jr., he is the person, if you want to submit, and I'm reading this directly from the GitHub, from the BIP, uh, people wishing to submit BIPs for first proposed ideas or document to the mailing list. After discussing, she, they should mail, email Luke uh, Dash Jr. and they have, they have their his email address here. After copy, editing, and acceptance, it will be published here. We are fairly liberal with approving BIPs and try not to involve in the discussion making on behalf of the commu- decision making on behalf of the community. The expectation is very rare cases of disputed resolutions when a decision is contentious and cannot be agreed upon. In those cases, the conversation option will always be preferred. Having a BIP here does not make it a formally accepted standard until its status becomes active. For a BIP to become active requires the mutual consent of the community. Those proposed changes should consider that ultimately consent may rest with the consensus of the Bitcoin users. And we'll get into more detail of that when we talk about BIPs. But Luke Jr. is the one that you um, kind of have to finally put your proposal to. He's also the second um, contributor to the, the BIP process with Amir Taki, with the one who created it, the guidelines. Um, so he is responsible for BIP2, which I uh, revised the process, if you will. Um, it's active. Uh, it actually replaced what Amir Taki had proposed initially. And we'll talk about that when we talk about BIP. But so Luke Jr.'s contributions to the Bitcoin code is BIP2. So the process upon which people can submit um, proposals. Uh, BIP 17, which is about consensus soft fork, uh, which was withdrawn. So there's different stuff. There's um, there's different types when you go to the BIP, and we'll get into the when we talk about BIPs. I'm just going to not go into too much detail, but just what BIPs he's contributed. Uh, hash script check was proposed. It wasn't activated. M and then standard transactions, which are, so the first one is 18, 19, uh, BIP 20, 22, 23, which was about fundamentals and pool mining. So he was a very early on contributor to the code in of itself. Um, his last one was BIP 145, which is Git block template updates for segregated witness. Currency exchange rate information and API application, BIP uh, 171, and block size weight fraud proof, uh, BIP uh, 180. So he's contributed uh, one, two, three, 
four, five, six, seven, eight dips to the overall proposals, but some of them haven't been um, finalized and implemented. Others are waiting um, either to be implemented or considered. Of the 199 BIPs that are currently standing in the Bitcoin um, code space or proposals, if you will. And this, mind you, doesn't speak about his other codes that he's done for mining, which we'll talk about as other contributions to the space or even the actual coding effort to, for each uh, BIP proposal. But those are the things that he has personally um, done for the space. So this comes from We Use Coins. It kind of summarizes his position to the space and what he has contributed. So Luke, uh, Luke Dash Jr., Bitcoin Core developer, has made over 200 contributions to the Bitcoin Core and maintains the Bitcoin Improvement Proposal section on GitHub. I find that very interesting because that's not was looked at, but maybe there's another Maybe this do they count comments as contributions, like if he's added something to uh, other people's proposals. A Bitcoin Core uh, Dash Jr. has been contributing to Bitcoin Core and Bitcoin since 2011. Segregated witness a proposal among other improvements increasing block transaction capacity was implemented as a soft fork with uh, Dash Jr.'s help. At Bitcoin 22 and 23, um, Dash Jr. is responsible for bits 22 and 23. BIP22 added protocol support for long pooling, which allowed to be notified of new templates immediately. BIP23 allows miners to check the basic fidelity of the next block before expanding, expanding work on it, reducing risk of accidental hard forks or mining invalid block, which is very important because that was one of the big concerns. There was a while there where there, where there was what's called orphan blocks, and when we talk about miners, we'll talk a little bit about that, it was occurring very heavily early on. And you want miners to be as efficient as possible because they're putting all those transactions into the block that is being pushed out to the network. So they're basically confirming stuff and you want them to be very, very efficient in confirming transactions and mining those blocks and getting those rewards. You don't want uh, a mining pool somehow being able to um, mine empty blocks and still receive reward for doing so. So yes, comments. He has added, I guess they're calling comments as an additional contribution. So any improvements to the code or anything needed to be added onto, he has contributed that, um, which is different from the actual bit proposals, if you will. The next contributor we're going to talk about is Hal Feeney. Of course, Hal Feeney had passed away from <clears throat> ALS in 2014. Um, as we spoke about in the article, uh, he was a developer of PGP Corporation. He worked with um, Phil Zimmerman to make that happen. He is an earlier user of Bitcoin, having received the first Bitcoin transaction from the Bitcoin creator, Satoshi Nakamoto. And he has helped uh, contribute to the um, Bitcoin code in space. Uh, this is from Wikipedia. Finney was a cyberpunk and said that it seems so obvious to me. Here we are faced with problems of loss of privacy creeping um, computerization, massive database, more centralization. And Chaman offers a completely different direction to go in, one which puts power to the hands of individuals rather than the governments and corporations. The computer can be used as a tool to liberate and protect people rather than to control them. And um, he's, he's talking about Chom's pro um, proposal of a peer-to-peer -peer, um, monetary system. He was an early Bitcoin user, received the first Bitcoin transaction from the Bitcoin's creator, Satoshi Nakamono. Uh, Feeney lived in the same town for 10 years that Dorian Shitoshio Nakamoto lived, adding to the speculation that he may have been Bitcoin's creator. Uh, Feeney denied that he was Shitoshio Nakamoto. So uh, Dorian is the guy that, I forgot which major magazine stated that he was the creator of Bitcoin, which was not true at all. Completely turned that guy's world completely upside down. And even put him, you know, him and his family in considerable amount of threat considering that um how much you know allegedly Satoshi Nakamoto is supposed to have in bitcoin he's supposed to have like a million bitcoin could have easily put his family at risk in 2013 50 finney proposed a bitcoin forum bitcoin talk that he he uh, was essentially paralyzed but continued to program he continued to program until his death he was working on experimental software called BC Flick, which uses trusted computing to strengthen Bitcoin wallets. 
During his last year of life, uh, Phoenix received anonymous calls demanding an extraordinary fee of 1,000 Bitcoin. He became victims of swatting, a hoax where perpetrators call of emergency dispatch using a spoof telephone number and pretend to have committed a heinous crime in the hopes of provoking an armed police response to the victim's home. In October 2009, Feeney announced in an essay on his blog, Less Wrong, that he'd been diagnosed with ALS in August of 2009. Prior to his illness, Feeney had been a very active runner. Feeney and his wife, Fran Feeney, raised money for ALS research with the Santa Barbara International Marathon. So Hal Feeney, if you look at the BIP, you won't find his name on any BIP proposals, but it's always been often understood that with prior to the to the BIP formation, that he was responsible for helping Shoshi Makamoto in the initial early days of Bitcoin, 2009 through 10, of codifying and fixing code and making it better, that he was a contributor to that um, through emails um, and Bitcoin talk forums. We we know that to be true. So Gavin Andreessen is another contributor to the uh, Bitcoin protocol. When Satoshi Nakamoto um, chose to leave the space, he handed the keys of the kingdom to Gra- Gavin Andreessen. Uh, this is from the Wicca. Is this, Gavin Andreessen is a software developer best known for his involvement with Bitcoin. He's based in Amherst, Massachusetts. Originally a developer of 3D graphics and virtual reality software, he became involved in developing products for the Bitcoin market in 2010. And by 2011, was designated by Satoshi Nakamoto um, as a lead developer on the Bitcoin Core, uh, the roughest implementation for the Bitcoin client software. In 2012, he founded the Bitcoin Foundation to support and nurture the development of Bitcoin currency. And by 2014, he left his software development role to concentrate on his work with the foundation. So one of the big things about Gavin Andreessen was that he made that talk to the CIA in 2013 um, discussing Bitcoin. Um, the CIA always kind of has these talks and forums in their space. They, they invite companies, uh, noted speakers, developers on different subject matters to talk and speak to their to their agents, if you will. And this spooked a lot of people within the Bitcoin space. It may have spoke, spooked Satoshi Nakamoto because as soon as Gavin Anderson announced that he was accepting that, um, he was going to do that talk, uh, Satoshi Nakamoto disappeared. Prior to 2014, um, Andreessen was a lead developer for a part of the Bitcoin digital currency project, working to create a secure, stable cash for the internet. Uh, Andreessen discovered Bitcoin in 2010, quickly recognized the brilliance of his design. Soon after, he created a website called the Bitcoin Faucet, which gave away Bitcoin in April 2011. Uh, Forbes quoted Andreessen, Andreessen as saying that Bitcoin is designed to bring us back to a decentralized currency of the people, and it is like better gold than gold. He was soon designated by the inventor of Bitcoin, Satoshi Nakamoto, to lead the development of the client software for the Bitcoin network, which is known as Bitcoin Core. Uh, Andreessen also created ClearCoin, an escrow type service, which was closed uh, June 23rd of 2011. After several years working on the software, Andreessen left the role of the lead developer of Bitcoin to work on the strategic development of technology he conceived of the Bitcoin Foundation, which became reality in 2012. Uh, Gavin initially thought he stated he believed that Craig Wright, who's a big ass scammer, was the real identity of Soshinaka Moto, but later retracted his statement. Yeah, Gavin is a great coder, if you will, but maybe not the best judgment when, when it comes to his interactions with human beings. Um, the Bitcoin Foundation was plagued with issues. Um, I think it's the stunk of it hasn't really. Um, write it itself in, in any way really and this Craig Wright thing kind of besmirched his um, reputation even further uh, you can find him with his own blog post at um, Gamma Nation Ninja uh, he you know he talks about the different things that are going on within the Bitcoin space so you often hear his name quite often when talking about the various solutions for um, the Bitcoin um, walk size, if you will. So the BIPs that he has contributed to, mind you, this isn't me. This doesn't count the comments where they the additional coding that he might have done on different BIPs. He proposed BIP 11, which is MMN standard transactions. 12, which is with 
a consistent soft fork, which was uh, withdrawn. An address format for pay to script hash 13, which was implemented. 16 pay to script hash, which was also implemented. Uh, block version 2 height in Coinbase 34 bit, which was a soft fork. Uh, March 23rd, the chain fork post modem, uh, which is basically an informational thing about some corrections that needed to be made within the Bitcoin code. He rejected the P2P messaging, uh, BIP61. BIP70 was a big payment protocol that was finalized. BIP71 was a payment protocol for MIME types. BIP72 is a Bitcoin UR extension for payment protocols. BIP101 was an increase in maximum big block size. Um, it was withdrawn, but it's considered a hard fork. 2 million bit, bit size limit with uh, SIG op and SASH ad limits is a 109, which is a hard fork. It was rejected. And that is his last bit proposal and pretty much his last contribution to the actual coding in itself or comments. I mean, he's still active in the community, um, speaking and talking about it, but he is no longer a Bitcoin core developer. Now we have Gregory Maxwell, who's one of the more controversial um, Bitcoin core developers and contributors to the Bitcoin um, block code. Uh, this is from Reuse Coins, where I'm getting this information. Uh, he is a Bitcoin core developer and co-founder and chief technology officer at Blockstream. Uh, Greg is one of the key architects of the two-way peg, which makes sidechains possible. He's been a Bitcoin core developer since 2001. I mean, 2001, 2011 and is one of the most active reviewers of the cryptographic protocol proposals in the Bitcoin industrial ecosystem. Uh, he's currently working on confidential transactions for Blockstream. Uh, he's contributed to many widely used techniques in the Bitcoin space, such as the uh, homomorphic key derivation used in BIP32 and trustless privacy preserving techniques such as CoinJoin, and proof of solid, blind proof of solvency. Uh, Greg is a longtime free software developer and comes to Blockstream from Mozilla, where he contributed to the DALA video compression project and co authored the Opus audio code. He also has over 15 years of experience developing, implementing, and operating embedded systems and protocols for large scale networking. For many in the Bitcoin community, Greg is likely the person to tell you that your protocol is broken and why. But he usually feels pretty bad about it. His BIP contributions are BIP 9 is what he has uh, proposed. So very early on he made a proposal. A uh, version BIT with timeout and delay, which was developed along with Peter Will, Peter Todd, and Rusty, Rusty Russell. Uh, he has made <laughs> tremendous amount of comments to all the different BIP proposals. Again, he's one of those active people that goes through and checks people's codes and information. Then we have Alan Rainier, who is um, who helped develop the Bitcoin Armory, which is a wallet, one of the very early, very extremely secure wallets um, that was um, developed. His contribution to the Bitcoin protocol, not to mention the different comments he's made and helped and adjust, is the multi-sig transaction distribution, the ability for um, wallets to have that. Um, it was informational, it was withdrawn, but that idea is something that was eventually built upon and implemented in wallets, not necessarily the actual core code in of itself, but... I guess you can say it is implemented in the code in the sense that it can happen, but a lot of wallets have multi uh, signatures built into them so that uh, not one person can control a particular uh, Bitcoin wallet. So, for example, if you're an exchange or a company, uh, just like uh, in the real world where there might be multiple authorizers for financial transactions, you can do that now with uh, Bitcoin, if you can, if you will. Eric uh, Labao is another contributor to the code. His proposals are really dealing with the actual solutions. So you will hear these BIPs quite a bit. But he began with BIP 83 as a proposal, which is a dynamic 
hierarchical deterministic key trees. Those are those HD uh, type of uh, wallets you see. Uh, it was just a draft proposal. It wasn't actually implemented in the code. But when you start going down towards more recent implementations, he had you know a new BIP, uh, BIP classification 123, uh, hierarchical demonstrate script templates 124. That was a draft. It was never app, uh, implemented. And then you get down into segregated witness 141. He's contributed that with along with Johnson Wu and Peter Will. Uh, 144 is again another segregated witness peer services. Uh, you might say an update or an addition to proposal. So segregated witness, when you hear that, um, he's one of the individuals that helped build that architecture for that type of solution. So Peter Will, again, he is a contributor here. He's contributed quite a bit of different proposals to the Bitcoin space. Beginning with 32, with the uh, hierarchical deterministic wallets, informational, it was final, it was implemented, 32. Uh, finite monetary supply for Bitcoin, it was a draft, required consensus in a soft fork. He also is, and you'll see this when talking about segregated witness, a version BIPs with timeout and delay. He contributed that very early on. Peter Will with Peter Todd, Greg Maxwell, and Rusty Russell. Russell. Uh, duplicate transactions with BIP was implemented into the code. Uh, dealing with malleability, it was withdrawn. That also required a soft fork. Uh, strict DR signatures, um, that was implemented, consensus soft fork. Black size falling technology growth, a hard fork, it was a draft, so there's a proposed hard fork. 141 is, uh, again, dealing with segregated witness. He contributed to that. 143 was a transaction signature verification for version zero witness program with uh, Johnson Liu. And 144 it was a, a segregated witness. So those are, are his proposals, uh, BIT proposals, and is a name that you will often see associated with segregated witness, one of those solutions. Another computer co contributor is Justin Revere. Uh, BIP 47 is reusable payment codes for um, hierarchical deterministic wallets. Um, this is a BIP that you will see some wallets um, implement within their wallet code, these payment codes. This is a type of solution that some people seek to help um, address the transactional fees that are associated with Bitcoin as a way to minimize the the, the rate, if you will. Um, there are some wallets that implement that. It hasn't been formally implemented in the code in itself. Like some of these BIPs are things that people can actually add either to a node or a wallet and doesn't have to um, be written into the Bitcoin protocol. I mean, if it was done, then all the wallets can do it and it'll be automatic. But some some companies, some individuals have done this for themselves. And then his other bit proposal is bit 80, which is hierarchical for non-colored voting pool dis deterministic multi-sig wallets. So just another wallet uh, proposal out there. Um, he also helped contribute to 81, which also has, has to deal with that. Uh, it's all informational. It's deferred. Uh, it has not been something that's been implemented into the and then you have Mike Hearn. Mike Hearn is another big, huge contributor to the Bitcoin protocol. Not, not to mention a lot of these guys make a lot of comments to other uh, BIPs, if you will, but he has proposed a lot of BIPs himself. So we have uh, Pong messaging. This is first contribution is BIP 31. 37 is connection to a bloom filtering. 64 is a Again, more to do with messaging. 70 is a payment protocol. It was something that was implemented into the blockchain uh, itself. And you will often hear him um, speak about the blockchain debate. Uh, he's very vocal with his different positions he has on it. Peter Todd. P 
Peter Todd, again, big contributor. Uh, he contributed part of bit nine, which you will hear about when it comes to um, getting these uh, segregated witness or lightning network implementations or other implementations to the Bitcoin protocol to address the block debate. Uh, bit nine has a play in that. He also uh, could help contribute to 63 stealth addresses as a BIP number allocation. Stealth addresses is something that other cryptocurrencies have implemented as standard into their protocol to prevent uh, people from being able to find out what it is that they're, sh they're sending or spending, if you will. 65 is has something to do with uh, OP check lock time verify, which was finalized and there was a consensus that there was a soft fork when that was implemented. And then no Bloom service bit, um, standard and proposed. He's made his contributions, adding the bit, but he's also, you know, made some comments and you'll hear his name quite often in the box, the box size debate when we actually kind of get the nit and gritty of it all. We will talk about him. Now, Ryan X. Charles may have heard his name in association with Reddit. He was, um, initially with Reddit to help maybe implement Bitcoin into their ecosystem that didn't happen, so he went and created yours, which just uh, we did the news last episode, which uh, did with the first micro payment into the ecosystem uh, through through his site yours, which is a content content distributed site. Uh, basically, you can put up uh, like medium blog style post, video, um, Anything like that you want to do, and you can put like either one cent or ten cent, whatever value you feel as a content creator that you think that people should pay you to fully read or fully see your video or listen to your stuff, your content creations. His proposal, if you will, is BIP45, is signatures of deterministic PTSH multi signature wallets. He did this with Manuel. Arwes and Matis Ajo Garcia, they would go on to create their own uh, wallet company, which is Airbit. Uh, we talk a little bit about Manuel Arwes. Uh, he's along with Ajo Garcia. They did Airbits, and those were their contributions there. And then you have uh, Jeff Garzik, which is the last person or second to last person we're going to talk about. He is a Bitcoin developer. Uh, this is from uh, We Use Coins. Uh, he serves as the Coin Center's board of directors, and he's advisor to BitPay. After leaving BitPay, Garzik founded Block, B-L-O-Q, in October 2015, and according to Block's website, it delivers enterprise-grade blockchain technology to leading companies worldwide. Uh, Bitcoin Classic is an alternative implementation of Bitcoin that attempted a hard fork. Uh, Car Garzik is listed as a developer on Bitcoin Classic website, but hasn't submitted any code publicly aside from a pull request to change the hard for activation threshold. Uh, Garzik proposed Bit100 and has initially received positive feedback from miners. No supporting code was released after it became clear that it was unlikely to be adopted. So Bitcoin Classic is one of those other solution proposals. Um, Gavin Andreessen is one of those developers. When we get in the heart of the matter, we'll, we'll discuss all the different groups there, but he also contributed to BIP35, one of his first BIP proposals, which has to do with the mean pool messages, which were standard. 102 is block size increase to the take to to the to this to um two megabits. That is um again you hear his uh Gavin Andreessen. When you start getting into the one hundreds is when you start getting into the, the whole block size uh issues you have like pretty much dealing with the 100s is when you start getting to the block size issues here you know you have peter wells 103 was block size following technology growth so jeff r garzik gavin andreessen peter will have contributed to that um we'll talk about some other individuals here they're not talked as much as other solutions but right in, pretty much starting with 10100 and it's for some reason is not here in the BIP, maybe because it has to do with a whole there's a whole issue with the Bitcoin Classic. But starting with 100 down, you start getting the whole increasing or decreasing the block size and different solutions happening. So last contributor is Shaolin Fry, kind of been around since the beginning. 
He was uh, he contributed BIP eight, which is version BIP, so guaranteeing lock in. Again, it's a draft. This is the type of thing that um, people talk about when talking about hard forks, soft forks. Uh, his BIP proposal will be something a mechanism, a possible mechanism for that. And then he has um, contributed to the, the segregated wit- witness um, proposals. His first one is consensus soft work, which is a mandatory activation of segway deployment. And then his other one is segregated witness is second deployment. Um, these are all drafts or proposals, BIP 148 and 149. Um, those are his proposals for the is- dealing with segregated witness, doing it by a soft fork instead of a hard fork, if you will. And then here are some other contributors. Um, they talk about increasing the block size. And contribute in other ways, but you don't hear them bantering around as often or as much. And like I stated, um, we'll talk about that when we get to, to the technical aspects of the block size debate. But you have TCON with 104, block size 75, max block size is like difficulty 105 is consensus based block size retargeting algorithm. BTC Dark contributed to that. 106 is consensus hard fork. A dynamically controlled Bitcoin block size max cap by Upal Chagavi. Uh, 107 is Washington um, Sanchez's dynamic limit on the block size. And then 109 consistence is a 2 million bit size limit with SIGPOP and standard hash limits. Uh, okay, that's not a block size. Let me start getting to the segregated witness beginning with 141. And so those are the people that have contributed to the Bitcoin space. This, is, of course, is not all the people that have worked on the code. But these are the names that are often spoken about or talked about or their bits or proposals are the things that are being discussed within the space and making you all, you know, kind of aware of who they are or what their place is within the Bitcoin community. But overall, you know, the Bitcoin community in itself is not about one single individual, no matter how grand or great the idea is. You, you have to get the consensus of the network. You have to get the consensus of the community. And if you can't cons- convince um, a majority of the community to implement your your proposal, if they don't think it's sound enough or good enough, then it's not going to happen. Um, also, you know, it can cause a hard fork or split into the chain, if you will, as in the case that happened with um, Ether. And nobody wants that. So that's it for this proposal. I mean, not proposal. That's it for this uh, discussion of the block size debate um, in this series. Next episode will be dealing with BIPs themselves, you know, how people contribute to them and how the, the chain, if you will, and the key BIPs that our people are discussing or talking about when um, discussing the what the actual BIPs themselves are saying when, he, when we're talking about you know, segregated witness, uh, block size, if you will, the, the key ones. And also importantly, how wallets are adding certain BIPs that weren't implemented into the Bitcoin protocol, that they're adding it into their to the wallets so that that wallet in itself would be more, more secure for your, your coins, if you will. So thank you for listening and to the moon. Thank you for listening. Please rate and review either through iTunes or Stitchers or any of the podcasting apps that you're currently using to listen to this show. Thank you and until next time. This has been a Herosha Shine Space Odyssey Network production.